the wine glass. And today we're gonna to be talking about everyone's favorite party starter, champagne. Now in this episode, we're gonna be talking about champagne and sparkling wine. But for right now, let's talk about champagne. So champagne is a region in France. It's about 85,000 acres and it's about 90 miles northeast of Paris. Now many people don't know, but only sparkling wine from Champagne, France can be called Champagne. And there's a reason for that. During the World Wars, everybody started topping up with their own version of Champagne. However, that started to ruin the reputation of Champagne, France. So once the wars were over and the treaties and accords started rolling out, France said, y'all need to figure it out, but you can't call it the Champagne anymore. And so the world adapted. Germany calls it Sec. Spain calls it cava, and Italy calls it spumante. And everywhere else, it's just sparkling wine. Now, now that we're done with the history, let's go into the process. So, champagne is made of three grapes. Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, and then Pinot Noir. So, champagne goes through two fermentation processes. And for those of you who don't know what fermentation is, it's where the yeast eats the sugar and it ends up creating alcohol and CO2. The exact formula is yeast plus sugar equals alcohol plus CO2. Now, the first process of fermentation is the process that all wine goes through. It makes the juice and the sugar into wine. Now, the second process is what makes sparkling wine and champagne so unique. So we have, depending on the winemaker, you're gonna use three different methods either method championnats or the traditional method and where the second fermentation happens in the bottle that they're going to sell in. So they will open up the cork, they will put in more yeast and sugar, they'll close it up and then they'll store it. Every several months they'll rotate it around just so that the yeast gets stuck at the bottom of the cork and it's not floating around and then they sell it from there. There you also have the transfer method. So the transfer method, you open up the bottle, you pour it out into a vat, you combine all the champagnes together, and then you put the yeast and the sugar in the vat, and then you pour it into the bottle from there. And then the second fermentation also happens in the bottle. Now, because it's a much more blended, it's considered a less quality process. Now, the last process is gonna be the Charmant method which is where everything happens in a airtight vat, and then the second fermentation gets pumped into the bottles in an oxygen-free environment, and then they'll seal it, and then they'll ship it off, and that's where they're gonna sell it from. So as you can tell, the method championnat, so the traditional method, is gonna come out with the more expensive champagne, and the Charmant method is gonna come out with the least expensive champagne. And a little fun fact for you, people who produce champagne spend more money on marketing than they do on the production. Interesting, right? So many of you might have had experience and where it's New Year's and you go to take a sip of the champagne and you're just like, oh, it's so bitter or it's so sour. Well, that means you haven't found the right bitterness level for you or dryness. So champagne actually comes in a range. You have natural brut, extra brut, brut, which is about 85% of all the champagne in the world, extra dry, sec, demi-sec, and sweet. Obviously, natural brut is gonna have the least amount of residual sugar, and sweet is gonna have the most. And residual sugar is just the sugar that's left over after fermentation. So once the yeast eats all that sugar, whatever's left, that's a residual sugar. Now, have you ever noticed that at parties, weddings, get-togethers, dinner parties, the first thing they hand you is a glass of bubbly? Well, there's a reason for that as well. Because of the effervescence, it enters your bloodstream almost immediately. So you're gonna feel a bottle of sparkling about 15 to 20 minutes faster than you would a still wine. But that gets the party going, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate how to open up a bottle of champagne because if you're not careful, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this bottle here. It's been chilling. You're gonna see this little tab right here. All champagnes have a tab of some sort. So here, uh, you just kind of put your finger 
and it lifts right up on this bottle here it's literally a little block tab so I'm gonna go ahead and you're just gonna pull it all the way around and off this comes so I'm put this right over here now you've removed the foil and you have exposed the cage so the cage what it does is it prevents the cork from flying out during that second stage of fermentation. So you're always going to put your thumb on the top. This is going to stabilize the cork. So there's this little ring here and you're just going to pull it straight out right here. So this, no matter what bottle sparkling, for some awesome reason, always has exactly six turns. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and you freed the cage. Some people like to open it with the cage. I don't want my ring to fly off, so I'm gonna go ahead and take that off real quick. So make sure your hand, the cork, is going to be in the middle of your hand, and you're just going to turn the bottle, never the cork, and ready? Just like that. Now, the reason I say you have to be very careful it's because a warm bottle of wine has about 90 PSI. A cold bottle of champagne is going to have 60 PSI. 90 PSI, 60 PSI. As a visual, your car tire is about 30 to 35 PSI. And now you understand why. Make sure that when you're actually removing the cork, you point it in a direction that is A, away from people, and B, away from fragile things, because it's possible that it can fly out, but just in case, you wanna make sure there's nothing in the way. Now, a very interesting fact is you can always tell between a younger and older champagne bottle based on the size of the cork when it expands. So this is a bit of an older one. As you can see, it's still very tight. And then here, is a young one. You see right here, it's bulged out a lot more, and the top is a little wider out than on this one. As you can see side by side, this is more kind of a straight curve. This kind of curves out right here. So a little interesting fun fact to kind of see the age because champagne bottles are never a vintage. They are always blended. 85% of the time, they are non-vintage. Only 5% of the time you'll see an actual vintage bottle of champagne and the rest of the 10% it's used for blending for the following year. Now, if you do not want your effervescence to escape your bottle as you are drinking or you're only having a glass or two, do not put the cork back into the bottle and do not use a still wines cork stopper or bottle stopper because it will shoot out of the bottle. What you need is a champagne stopper. So as you can see, it has this part right in the center, which acts kind of like a suction, and it goes right in and removes all the oxygen. And as you can see here, it has a hook. And that hook stays underneath the lip of the bottle, so it's holding on, so it's not gonna shoot out. Leave this right here for a quick moment. Always drink your champagne within a year and a half to three years. You do not want to age your champagne. And when you go to open champagne, the first couple times you'll hear like a really loud pop, the cork might fly out of your hand and you might spill a little champagne. It's okay, we're all starting out. However, as you get better and better and better, the pop will get silent, more silent and more silent. An old professor of mine always said, that a true professional of opening champagne will open it and it'll sound like a nun farting. Just very quiet, very little of gas. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pour out the champagne bottle because there is a particular method you wanna do this. So same way, you wanna hold it right up and then right out. So unlike with still wine, you don't wanna just pour straight in because you're just gonna get a bunch of bubbles and you're not gonna have any wine in there. So tilt your glass and then pour it like this. So you see how much champagne I got out of that? 
decent amount because I did a small pour. If I were to pour like this, not a whole lot got in there if you think about it. Think about where it was. It was all the way down here. So if you're just pouring straight in, those bubbles are gonna shoot right out and you're gonna have to stop a lot faster because you don't want it to pass the brim. But if you tilt your glass when you're pouring the champagne, you're just gonna get the right amount without too many bubbles. Just like that. And don't forget to always tap it when you're done. I hope you guys liked this video, and if you did, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video. Remember, drink responsibly. Happy drinking!